Okay, um, everyone, good afternoon. I guess uh, we can get starting now, right? Okay, first of all, uh, thanks for attending today's session. Uh, after what a crazy week we have last week, I'm glad that all of you, you know, are able to find your sanity and uh, join us today. My name is Quack Sir Kwang King. You can just call me King or you can just me, call me Quack. My former colleagues at Malaysia Kini used to call me KS, right? Um, some of, uh, I think some of uh, my former colleagues might be here as well. A little bit uh, introduction about myself. I am a data journalist. Before this, I was a journalist at Malaysia Kini for eight years, uh, later a uh, news editor there, right? Then I got a scholarship to study new media and media innovation in the Neuron University. That was when I picked up data journalism. I returned to KL in 2015, started my own company called Data N that provides training uh, consultation uh, for newsrooms and journalists on data journalism. At the same time, trying to advocate and trying to promote open data and trying to open, uh, advocate more use of data by journalists in Malaysia in this region as well, right? Uh, earlier this year, I joined the Polizer Center which is a uh, journalism organization based in Washington, D.C. as the data editor. So I have less time for training, um, but you know, whenever there is a training from Malaysian journalists, I will try to you know, um, allocate time and try to do my best, all right? So this, uh, the whole workshop, uh, the whole workshop about elections, right, is you know, of course uh, organized, uh, funded by Google News Lab. All right, and I think Trina yesterday has introduced a Google News Initiative. Uh, Trina, who is also here, uh, is another trainer for this workshop, and she's the teaching fellows uh, for the Google um, in Southeast Asia. All right, so um, thank you again for Google News Initiative for hosting and funding you know, this workshop for everyone here. And today uh, we are going to talk about data analysis for elections. Yesterday, it was fact-checking. Um, today, we are going to look at <clears throat> several different things about how do you use data for election reporting, right? There are three parts uh, to my presentation. And then I will also share with you some of the ways to organize data in Google Spreadsheets, right? How can we calculate you know, the simple things to know the swing um, in election results and things like that. Before um, leaving Malaysia Guinea, I used to cover a lot of elections um, when I was with Malaysia Guinea. My first election that I covered is actually the 2000, uh, 2008 election, after that 2013 election. And the 2011 Sarawak state elections, I was assigned to be based in Sarawak for one and a half month around that. I was based in Sri Aman, right? Not Kuching, not Cebu, but Sri Aman. And I was able to travel to the inland area uh, to do the coverage for Malaysia Kini. So um, like all, you know, I, I like to, you know, see election as a three stages event, right? So we have uh, pre-election, right? When the candidates are trying to woo the voters, right? To marry them, to give them the votes. And then we have the voting and we'll see the results, right? And after the results, that's, you know, after the election, that's when, you know, we start, start to um, face the reality. And, you know, our politicians, of course, they will show their true colors, right? And then we'll live together for another five years, you know, until uh, when it comes to the next election for us to make a decision again. So I also separate the kind of reporting for these three different stages, right? The first one is, you know, data stories that help voters make informed decisions. I think this, is, this should be the number one purpose of any election reporting before the polling day, right? Before the polling day, all our reportings are there to help voters to make the best decision for themselves, right? Uh, we are trying to empower them so that they understand, they, they know the candidates, right? And they know what would change the general outcomes, right? 
what's at stake here, right? Where are the key battlegrounds? Where are the key candidates, right? Because this helped them to make decision. And throughout the election coverage, right, usually Malaysian politics is very much focused on personalities, right? But what the voters need actually is more focused on policies, right? But policies, as we all know, is boring. Um, it's very hard to make it relevant to everyone, right? But still, this is something that, you know, is very important because it will affect our life, daily life for the next five years, right? Um, also, campaign transparency. I think it is our job to promote more transparent and more uh, integrity during the whole campaigning period. And this is actually a good opportunity to highlight local issues, especially when you are in rural areas, right? There are so many issues about infrastructures, about access to amenities, right? In, in the, usually in the, in both, actually in both urban and rural areas, right? And this is the great opportunity to highlight them because the politicians will try to fix them as fast as possible. Or they, quite, they are, will try to offer some promises, right? Which they will be, you know, under pressure to fulfill after the elections. Of course, many times they don't fulfill at all, right? But at least we make them to offer some promise, right? Offer some, um, 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 yeah, something during the elections, right? If we are able to highlight local issues. So these are some of the things that we can um, actually do using data, right? Then we have election day. Election day, usually you are, you are not able to do much besides from focusing on the results, right? Everybody is, is looking at the results, right? Whatever that you cover before the results uh, come out, actually doesn't really matter, right? Um, you can cover like how, you know, the candidates visit polling stations, probably some fighting will happen, right? Uh, but that don't really matter much, right? People are just waiting for a result to be announced, you know, on that night. Then the third part is, of course, post-election reporting, right? This is, you know, what we usually do. <clears throat> Results analysis, everybody is going to do that, right? A voter's characteristic, right? Um, rural versus um, urban, young versus old, right? Um, races, um, income levels, you know, those kind of things. And of course, winner's information. Winner's information here means that who won and who are they? And they are going to form the next ruling government, the next ruling coalition. And of course, we need to help our voters to understand them better, right? So those are post-election reporting. Of course, this list doesn't cover everything, right? But just some of the ideas that I think, you know, I can share with you today to look at how we can use data to better cover our election. Right, the first one. Know the candidates, right? We need to know the candidates so that we can vote, right? As simple as that, right? And candidates can be, there are so much information about candidates that I just, and it, it, you can have very creative way of showing them, right? I want to show you two examples. The first one is done by Singapore Straits Times, right? So if you look at, Singapore just had its uh, elections last year okay then if you look at this page um straits time actually done a very good job in covering the elections using some very interactive and creative ways right if you look at this how many candidates have a background in law this is actually to help you understand you know the the, the, the candidates in a more interactive way more um, fun way i would say so you just drag the circle to select how many of them have a background in law and it will tell you that uh, there are only 26, okay? I selected 34. Then they will tell you that, okay, what are their backgrounds, professional backgrounds, the PAP, the PAP candidates, and yeah, these are the people. Then the PSP, the opposition party, the workers' party, right? And we'll, we'll do, uh, again, the next round will be how many are newcomers, how many are new faces. So I would have to do like probably many of them. Oh, not bad. All right. The real, the answer is 77. I got 74. Right. So then they will tell you how many in different um, elections. Right. 
and it keeps scrolling. Uh, we, we, it will then give you more information about candidates, right? And yeah, young candidates. Yeah, probably not so young, right? Very few of them under 40. Then they will show you who is the youngest, who is the oldest, and the distribution in each party. Okay, the age distribution of the candidates, right? So something that you know we can probably consider how do we use a more creative and engaging way to introduce the candidates of each party and to compare among them right, to our uh, voters? The second I want to show you is this California legislators just like you. This was published by Carl Matters, right, which is a local publication in the state of California, US. So the interesting thing is that they, this is after election. Well, after election, right? you want to know who are the lawmakers, who are the legislators, and the interesting thing is that they are trying to make it relevant to each individual reader. Okay, so if you are a, you are whether you are a, you know, you are a female or male, young or old, right? You are able to play with this by using your own uh, demographic to find which legislators is actually like you, just like you. So, I am male or female or transgender. So I'm a male, Asian. I'm heterosexual, I'm in my 30s, and there are only two legislators like me, right? I don't earn that much, I earn under 100,000, zero. No one uh, has the same characteristic like, like me, right? So this is interesting because um, it makes it relevant to each individual reader, okay? We also call this as personalization of information, right? So if you're a female, you can change it to Latino um, in the 50s. Yeah, then it's one legislator. And you are able to see who is that. Okay. So we can do the same thing. This is although this is for elected legislators, we can also do the same thing for candidates, right? Right. The next thing that you are able to do is actually. Not just the demographic, but also the political and economic background of candidate. This is much harder to get because this kind of information, right, is sometimes is not out there for the public. Sometimes you have to dig deeper. Sometimes you have to collect your own um, data, right? So, but the result of this, you know, could be very interesting. I'm going to show you two story. Okay, this is from BBC Indonesia, right? But this is Indonesian. But what happens is that it is asking you to say that, that to, to pick your province, right? So I'm going to put Jawa, Jawa, Jawa Tengah, okay? And it will tell you which jalon or which candidate in that in that province, you know actually comes from a political family or political uh, empire, right? Here, it used, I think it used to work. Dynasty, dynasty, okay? Political dynasty. So you see that this is the, uh, this is the candidate, Sudiman Said, right? And the wakil is Ida Fawzia. And this Ida, Ida, Ida Fawzia is actually the, uh, is, is actually the wife of Taufit Abdullah, who is another uh, lawmaker, right? So some of the candidates, you will be able to see that they have like, you know, probably half of their families are all in politics, okay? You can click on any of them and you will look at the different jalon and you'll see. You can see this guy, he's, um, I'm not sure it's his or she, uh, the father, and also the sister, right? they are all in politics, okay? The same um, project, similar project has been done in Taiwan, okay? Taiwan also has, you know, a very traditional political culture, right? So if you scroll down, you will click on it. The first one is, you know, this is, um, this is the name of the, The, the lawmaker, okay, the name of the lawmaker, 
and sorry, this is the uh, area, right, or the constituency, the lawmaker. And this is the first one, the blue color is how many times he has been elected. So this is his fourth term, right? And then his direct um, family members who are lawmakers, right? So here is saying that his father, his father also father, uh, and brother, and another brother, right? His father have uh, uh, has uh, are two terms lawmakers, and their brother are two terms lawmakers, right? This is a direct family member, and then there are also extended family members, right? This is I think in laws, right? Have one, two, three, four, five, six, six terms, right? Um, as a lawmaker, and that's this another one, right? This is his um, um, daughter in law, no son in law, right? Two terms lawmakers, and. Yeah. This is his his um, his niece, okay. Um, eight times lawmakers, eight terms lawmakers, right? So in this family, right, the family's members actually have in total twenty four terms, um, in the office, okay. So you are able to see, you know, different um, lawmakers, you know, how are they, you know, how are their families are also lawmakers in the politics, right? This one, of course, you can um, check different and you can search for a name and you can look at um, different cities, different regions in, in Taiwan, right? So this is something that is, you know, interesting to look at, you know, who has a, all the political families, right? I think this is also very similar in Malaysia as well, if we do this kind of report. Another one is to look at you know, sensitive information here, I mean, information that is even harder to get, for example, criminal records, court cases that involve candidates, right? Um, why is it important? Because we want to know, of course, that if, if our candidates are involved in corruption cases, are involved in any criminal um, charges, and what happened to those you know, charges and those cases, right? So one project that I would like to show you, it's the Reuters election coverage of the India elections in 2019, right? And you will see that this, because all the candidates, right, they have to submit their photograph when they uh, submit their candidacy, right? And the photograph and the, all their um, the application form, right, will be made public. So they are able to get all the candidates face here, right? So if you just scroll down, you will see that these are all the candidates in India general election. So far, 2,000, they have a crazy number of candidates, 5,000. In India, a candidate can run for two seats, okay? You scroll through 7,000 and to only get 700 of female candidates. And there are also six third gender candidates, right? So the interesting thing is here is criminal charges, yeah. You see that? There are candidates who have 240 cases with them, right? From the BJP. I think the challenge in India would be to find a candidate without a criminal charges. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Uh, I think there's a. I think there's data shows that 40% of BJP candidates face criminal charges. Yeah, it's actually quite hard. Okay. Right, so um, then the money and all those things, right? So they, I think, it's, again, it's a good way of telling, you know, the voters who are their candidates. And this guy, like, how can this guy has um, 240 cases with him? What is wrong with him, man? Okay. Um, let me go back. Right, so those are the things that I think, you know, we, if you're able to find the data, it will be very useful for our voters to make a decision, right? The next one is their performance, right? We have to look at their report card when they were uh, lawmakers. This year, of course, I refer to the incumbents, right? How many questions they ask, how many speeches they give, right? How many promises fulfilled uh, by them, right? So in this case, I cannot find any data about Sarawak Doon. Sarawak, the handset for Sarawak Doon is not even available on the Sarawak Doon website. It is only there for you to download for one month after the sitting finish. After one month, it is gone. You need to write in 
to the um, office to ask for a copy. But probably you can get a copy from other dunes, right? I, I believe they have a copy because they are they are in the in the sitting, right? So they will get a copy of the hand starts, right? So by looking at the hand starts, right, you are able to actually look at you know their how active they are in the uh, state assembly, probably their attendance, how many times they ask questions, how many questions they ask, you know, things like that. So I just want to give you one resources by a new initiative called My MP, right? It will be launched next week. It is a group of journalists and uh, volunteers. They started this database to look at the performance of MPs, right? This is for MPs. This is not for Sarawak elections. Sorry about that. Nobody started anything on Sarawak election yet, uh, but this is for MPs, right? But I, what, I'm, what, I, what I show you here is that, you know, something like this would be very helpful. So let me just show you. Um, I can check, for example, Chong Jianzhen because he's going to do, he will, he's also an Adun in uh, Sarawak, but this is his record in um, parliament. You will see Etika Kerja under here. He asked four questions. Two kehadiran for 11 sesi parliament. Wow, not, not very good, right? <laughs> Empat soalan dikemukakan. Yeah, this are the soalan, right? Okay. And uh, MYMP, uh, they are, my MP, they are going to be launched next week and they're happy to work with any journalists. If you guys are interested to work with them on the Sarawak elections, right? Doing something like this, right? Similar things like, like this, you know, feel free to reach out to them, right? Just search for mymp.org.my, okay? Right. So these are some of the basic things that I think basic information that we should provide. Sometimes the lawmakers, the candidates, they don't provide them, they don't provide that to, to, to the voters as well, right? They just put up their posters and that's it, okay? Next, look at this, you know, um, this is also very important is to let voters know what, would change the general outcomes, right? What is the key battleground? Where are the key battlegrounds? And will it is it possible for the state government to be changed? Which we all know is not possible here, right? So what's at stake, right? What can be achieved, you know, by both the incumbents and the opposition, right? So someone should do something on this one. So let's look at some of the um, Sorry about that, guys. There's a video playing on. If you can hear the sound, let me just stop it. Yeah, just to show that uh, the star also has a interactive that looks at, you know, who asked the questions in parliament. Yeah, yeah, they do a interactive page. You can search for um, any. Uh, how come I cannot? Oh, I should search for like. Okay. Name. Oh, topic. So this is the topic. And um, there's another one directive that asks you to put in name. Yeah. For it to look at how many numbers and things like that. Okay. So yeah, I want to show you this one. For example, the New York Times, you know, um, many of the US publications actually did a good job covering the US presidential elections. Okay. This one is um, both a simulation and also a prediction, which means that you're able to put like, put this in, say that, okay, what if Biden in Michigan, right? Uh, and Pennsylvania as well, and Arizona, and Minnesota, not enough, still lack one state, then Wisconsin, yeah, Biden's win, right? You can also put that in here, you know, take it out, okay? And they will give you like a potential outcome. There are like four scenarios. We'll reset it. Second one, right? So probably we can tell voters, you know, what are the possible scenario, uh, what are at stakes, things like that, right? To engage the voters so they are more, they get more interested in the political process, and hopefully, you know, um, they would then make a much better decisions, right? Next story is again by Straits Times, but this is a, uh, this is an old story in 2018. They did a very good job in explaining to Singaporeans the election of Malaysia, right? Which I think we also need um, for our audience here. We have a lot of audience who are not familiar with Sarawak uh, election, especially those non-Sarawakians, right? 
So we need something to explain to non-Sarawakians. This is not just you know, for them to know because Sarawak is part of the country, but also it's a good opportunity for media organizations right, to actually engage with your uh, readers. right? Because election is always a time when people are more interested in news and politics. right? So if you're able to build something that is engaging, you might be able to retain more readers or users right, after the election. So just look at Straits Time. I think they did a very good job, right? To describe, basically, it's an explainer to explain um, what is happening in you know the Malaysian general election, who is who, Barisan National, and okay, they look at its history a little bit, right? Then they 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 tell you about they focus on Pago. Okay, and then the uh, Pakatan Rakyat in 2008 and Pakatan Rakyat in 2013. And then PAS left the coalition and later they became Pakatan Harapan, right? And all the splits, see how the splits between uh, Pakatan Harapan and PAS, okay, right. And what about the state election, right? Then they look at different states. These are the states that was uh, ruled by the Pakatan Harapan before 2013 and also Kelantan by pass, right? Yeah. So like a general overview, right? I think we also need this kind of reporting for Sarawak as well. Okay, next. Just like I mentioned, right? Um, we should try to report more on the policies instead of personalities of pollution. I mean, we all know that but it's very hard to do because policies sometimes is you know kind of boring, right? So I'm going to show you some examples. One is the Modi's report card by Reuters, as well as the manifesto of uh, different candidates in the Taiwan presidential election, as well as the U.S. presidential election. So let's have a look at them. The Modi's report card is basically very simple. They are tracking the promises made by him in the last general election and to see how many have been fulfilled or partially fulfilled or not fulfilled at all. Okay, so this is the report card. If you look at the, the report, uh, the, the, the whole reporting is actually quite um, simple. You can click on it to read the details. So this is like, okay, now is the end of his term. We need to decide whether we should elect him again. And let's look at his um, report card, right? There are some interactive elements inside here. I think the last election in 2018, um, several newsrooms also developed like a promises tracking uh, website. However, it is not, you know, uh, relevant anymore because you know, the collapse of the Pakana Harapan government. This is interesting. Well, this is actually a quiz developed by Initium, right, uh, which is based in Hong Kong and Taiwan, right, to ask the users to pick the policies that favor them, that they, that they, they prefer policies, not candidates, but policies, right? So if you start, uh, you can pick first the way who you want to vote. Let's say I haven't decided. And now you, have, you need to pick um, nine topics that you think they are uh, important to you, right? So I'm going to pick, I'm going to simply pick, okay, six. Let's say I'll pick six, okay? There are nine of them. Then they ask you the policies, right? Do you prefer policy A or policy B when it comes to housing? Okay. Then healthcare. This is uh, culture. This is uh, constitutional reform. This is uh, the South East Sea dispute. Um, this is the higher education university, right? Um, low wage problem among the youngsters. Uh, food security. Uh, financial, I think this is tax reform. Okay, right. Then you can, you can skip this if you don't want to give your uh, personal details, you can skip. And then it will tell you that based on the policies that you pick, right, you are actually more towards this guy, right? The current president is, uh, this, this is, the, is the woman here, okay? You are more towards this guy. So instead of looking at policies, they actually look at, you know, the manifesto, 
um, offered by the different candidates, right? And ask you or ask you to take the quiz based on policies and based on your answers, it will tell you which one actually you know is a better choice for you, which one um, match your preference in terms of policy, right? So this is a way to divert, not to divert, to direct the attention towards policies and not just personalities. This is the same that is a quiz. I uh, won't be able to open it because there's a paywall. Let's see if it will block me again. Yeah. It's, okay, you can try it, right? Um, it's actually uh, it's the same thing. It asks you several questions um, on the preferred, your preferred policies, and it will tell you, you, know, you match more with you know, either Biden or uh, this is the primary, like, like Elizabeth Warren and um, um, Bernie Sanders, right? So this is what I mean when you think that policies on manifesto are boring, maybe you can make it something more interactive, right? Something more personalized for users. Next, campaign transparency, right? I know we like to cover campaign strategies, but sometimes campaign strategies is kind of like self-shock, shock sendiri kind of reporting, right? We do the analysis, see how they, you know, uh, cover the rural voters, things like that, right? But does it really matter to voters? Um, sometimes it just shocks the theory, right? And also, you know, it's good for outsiders, right? Um, non karaokeans to look at, non-voters to look at, right? However, there are still important um, things here that we can report, right? One of them is actually campaign transparency. How transparent? Is there any elements of manipulations inside, right? One thing that, you know, many media applications have been doing over these few years is social media targeting. You want to know how political parties or candidates use social media to target uh, their target audience, their target groups, uh, whether there's any you know, um, um, racial or um, misinformation, you know, those kind of messages in their social media targeting. So let's look at this example. This was done by a reader of Taiwan, right? During, again, during the 2020 Taiwan presidential election. This one, um, they got the data from Facebook. This is the data made available, made public by Facebook on political campaign uh, on the social media uh, platform on Facebook. So if the candidates or the parties, right, if they bought advertisement, uh, targeting uh, uh, advertisement on Facebook, then Facebook will make those data available. Okay. So based on this one, you will be able to know who are they targeting, right? So the first option is that where do you live? Okay. Um, then how old are you? Because this are this is how the politicians or the parties right target you. And whether you are uh, your gender, okay, male or female, okay. If you select it, then these are the advertisement that you would see, you know, in your on your Facebook page, right? These are the um, how to say the advertisement bought by candidates, right? Okay, I think all the graphics are no longer available. Okay, so this is to look at you know how candidates reach out to voters on Facebook. You can also choose any um, profile here to look at, you know, how they, uh, what kind of advertisements are born, right? So I think from Malaysia, uh, of course, we, we are, we can, it, it's not, it's not by default that uh, Facebook would make the data available, right? but I think we should always ask. We should always ask so if Facebook can do that for Taiwan, for US, for many other countries, right? Why can't it do for Malaysia, right? We are having an election here. We want to have more transparent in terms of political um, advertisement, right, on, on Facebook. We can ask Facebook to give us or to make public the data, right, so that we can do analysis. This is a one step, I think, further for political, you know, uh, um, um, campaign transparency in Malaysia. But this depends on, you know, whether our journalists have the, you know, can stand together and ask for it. If we can ask for a Sarawak election, then we'll be able to get uh, general elections data as well. 
Money politics, right? Again, in Malaysia, we our political political parties don't have to actually declare all their expenses, right? Under our elections uh, acts, right? Only the candidates have to declare the party. You know, if you are getting a, a party to pay for it, right? Uh, the party don't have to declare it, right? It is a flaw in our election um, rules, but sometimes, right? Um, you are media are still able to do something differently, right? To shed more lights on um, money politics. So, for example, these two stories again, they are from Taiwan. Taiwan has been doing a great job uh, in this front. This is the game. This is the game that you know asks you which which position you are trying to contest. Right and uh, telling you that how many uh, voters are in your constituency, right? And what do you want to buy? Right? How much? How many pants you want to buy? How many shopping bags you want to buy to um, give it to your voters? Okay, you can also go for like those huge, you know, um, billboard. The, the poster of the flags, right? The uh, mass gatherings, you know, you can go for Facebook, Line, uh, TV advertisement, right? So you can put in all those different... Okay, once you're done, then it will tell you that this is how much you spend, right? And this is usually the expenditure to contest for a mayor, city mayor, right? Uh, but of course, I didn't. I just simply clicked, right? So uh, I just spent this much, right? So if, because we, we know how much, I mean, we know the things that they have put up on the streets. They think they've given up for free, right? So if you are able to um, quantify them, uh, we're able to aga aga, right? estimate uh, how much uh, they are spending, right? And you don't need to get the actual expenditure records to make this kind of interactive right? It is part of you know, raising awareness about it. This is another uh, project by a reader uh, from Taiwan. What happened is that they ask readers, right, to when they see a billboard, political billboards, right, political uh, advertisement billboard, they ask the readers to take a picture and send to them together with the uh, locations to the, with the GBS, right, to send to them. And they collect all the political billboards and they put it together. So let me just show you. You can pick um, which area um, it, is, it is loading. So you will see these are the political billboards. And at the end of election, they are able to total up, you know, to have an estimated um, cost of how much they actually spent for political billboards, right? They actually ask the users to crowdsource for them. Right, because you are not going to send a reporters to the whole state to cover everything. Mm, maybe you could, right? Maybe Banama has the manpower to do that, right? But this one, they mobilize their readers to ask the readers to like, if you see a billboard, send to us, right? Then they collect them together um, and show them in a database. Right, uh, another thing is to highlight local issues. I don't have any um, examples here because I think our local issues are quite specific. In Sarawak, you always have the problem of infrastructure, electricity, water, schools, things like that. Deforestation in the rural areas, um, land disputes, you know, uh, problems with the indigenous people, and also poverty, right? Um, I'm going to show you several uh, resources that might be helpful. One is the Global Forest Watch, which monitors forest loss, okay? Forest loss using satellite images, right? So if you want to look at Sarawak, which district has more forest loss, you, we can, this is tree cover gain. This is tree cover. Now we are looking at tree cover loss. But just to remind you, tree cover loss doesn't mean it's not always deforestation. It could be other factors, right? So check probably. These are detected by satellite images, not government records, you know, not on the ground inspection, okay? So you can move the slider here to, let's say I want to look at 2016 until now because the last election was 2016, right? You're able to, you are able to see which area has lost its tree cover. These are like 
urban areas, right? Let's move move in. If you move to rural, you'll see, you know, for example, this is huge. I'm, I'm not sure what happened here. Yeah. So if you overlap the data here with a Google map or with you know any any other maps, right, you'll be able to see um, which are these areas. So I can actually change it to um, satellite images. Yep, so satellite images is here. Aha, uh -huh, you see there is a huge area cleared. I'm not sure for what purpose. Okay, so this will help you if you are covering like issues about um, deforestation or issue about land grab in the rural Sarawak, right? This data might help you to better illustrate and also help you to detect you know, possible uh, issues in the rural areas, all right? Uh, all the data here is uh, open data. You can download them and then you can use some mapping software to visualize them, right? I don't have time to go into detail. We only have one hour here, but just to show you these are the, some of the resources that you can use. Another one is actually shared by the uh, our Department of Statistics. Uh, we call it DOSM, D-O-S-M, right? DOSM. So DOSM actually, every three years, 2016, 2019, they release something called local stats, right? Local stats give you um, data of different indicators, okay, for district, every district. So let me go to, the latest data is 2019, yeah? There's no 2020 data, okay? They, they share with us, they, they share with everyone a Google Drive, a Google folder. You can go to Sarawak. And if you go to any um, district here, right, you are able to download uh, an Excel file. Just uh, I just now I already downloaded one. Let me just show to you uh, what data you have in those files. They have quite good data. For example, the number of hospital, the number of beds in each hospital. So let me just show you this one is for Kuching. Okay, Kuching, Sarawak. Um, for those who can't see, I'll just read out to you. Uh, the, all the, the, the basic population, the, those are those they are all they are all inside. The interesting thing is that, for example, number of school, right? Uh, primary school, secondary school, number of teachers, okay. Number of pupils, right? For example, and you also have the income, right? Income, the Gini coefficient of poverty. You also have incomes. Right, and all those things, right? So this is available for everyone to download, right? In this folder, okay? I'm gonna send you the link. If <laughs> you fill up the feedback form, I will send you everything that I have presented today, all right? Or you can try to search for it. It is, this is not a secret, this is actually public data. And it's not just for Sarawak, there, there's also like uh, for all the other districts, but the, the smallest level, the smallest area is district. You can't get anything smaller than that. You can't get, let's say, Mukim, no, just district, okay? So using that, you're able to look at infrastructure, deforestation, you know, all these things, right? And it will be interesting to compare 2016 with 2019, right? For a certain district, if you want to evaluate the performance of the state government, or the performance of the lawmakers representing that district, right? So it depends on what you want to, to show, right? But I just think that this is a good opportunity to highlight local issues. Okay, um, we are going to the end soon. Election day, of course, election day, everyone only cares about results, right? Um, typical, this is, a, this is a very typical um, result pitch, right? To see who, who won. I, I don't think I need to, you know, go, go through them. You can just search for, you know, recently there are elections in Singapore, in US, in Taiwan, right? Um, they all produce very nice, you know, very pretty, very clear uh, visualizations on um, election results, right? I, can, I think you can refer to them. After result, the interesting thing is that we also want to look at the swing. Right, swing between parties. Right, um, currently there are like interesting things that people are doing uh, with the swing, swing visualization. For example, this one they use like a cone to represent it. New York Times like to use the arrow, whether it's to the left or to the right. Okay, uh, these are different things. You know, um, all this swing we can actually prepare it before the elections. Once we get the result, 
if you already prepared the spreadsheets, right, we can generate the swing uh, very, very quickly. All right. I'm, I'm going to share with you two templates uh, of the Google Sheets that allows you to compute, uh, computerize to calculate them. The next one, um, a further analysis is not just the swing, but to correlate the voting behavior with voter demographic, right? So here is one example. Let me show you. Oh, this is the swing that I mentioned just now. Yeah, this is the example, right? So Neuro Times, they, they, are, they are not just look at a swing. As you can see, the arrows represent how big is the swing, yeah? Towards Republic, Republicans or towards, you know, uh, Democrats. But they actually look at areas where 30% or more are born abroad, which means those are immigrants, right? Immigrant neighborhoods. And interestingly, the immigrants, they are actually more pro-Trump than pro-Democrats, um, right? Although Trump is the one who wants to limit more immigrants from coming into the US, right? But the result shows that, you know, in areas where there are more immigrants, there was a swing towards Republican, right? So this is quite interesting, right? Can we do that for Malaysia? Um, yes, it, it is possible. Let me show you this story. Um, there's an interactive chart here that can't load on my Chrome. I'm not sure why, but it's okay. I will show you the map that this journalist have made. This is done by Oriental Daily. So you can see that there are two maps here. This one showing the parliamentary results, okay? Which one won by um, the opposition? No, actually, they later became the... Um, uh, this is 2013. Yeah, no, no, the opposition, right? Pakatan Rakyat then, okay? And this is the income, um, household income of different district. District, yeah, this is not parliamentary seat, yeah? Because our dosum, our statistic department, um, use district as their unit, right, when they share data, okay? However, you can actually look at this map and make a comparison. And you will see that, of course, you know, urban areas, high income areas, they have a highly high likelihood to vote for the opposition, right? This is just one example. Imagine you can do this with not just income, you can do that with other, you know, um, indicators, other types of data that I just show you, you know, that you can get from the uh, Google, Google folder shared by the statistics department, All right? This will be, of course, the, the borders of district and parliamentary constituencies are not always the same, but you can kind of look at the overlapping areas, right? So this also applies to Sarawak, all right? Another one that you can do is who are the winners, right? The last thing, probably the last thing you can do is who are the winners. So let me show you one interesting um, project from, again, from Cal Matters. Cal Matters is not like a huge national publication like New York Times. It's just a very local publication for California. So what happened here is that after the election is finished, they mark, they put, um, so they map out all the lawmakers and ask you to um, identify yourself like I am a independent, I am a Republican, or I am a Democrat, I am white and straight, and in my 60s, I made a lot of money. Yeah, these are the lawmakers that are similar to me, right? If you don't want to look at your, you don't, you don't want to match your own characteristic, you can then click on overview. It will tell you the um, sexual like, orientation, income, um, party, race, ethnicity, age, gender, and things like that, right? So the title is actually how, oh, sorry, how diverse is the California legislature? We can do also the same thing after election. We can compare the new um, line of lawmakers with the previous uh, groups of lawmakers to see if it is getting younger, older, more diverse, less diverse, more gender equal or not. Right, those are all the story ideas that you know, I think you, know, you can use to do better reporting, right? So next, we have only 10 minutes, but I would like to share with you two spreadsheets. 
Uh, at first, I thought this workshop should be something that, you know, you work with me doing some calculation. But then I thought that, you know, probably most of you already know like, how to do basic calculations. So we don't have to show you that. And instead, right, what is more interesting is that all these different ideas of covering election using data. Uh, but in case if you are looking for like, oh, if I got the results, how do I compute them, right, things like that, there are two um, spreadsheets that I would like to share with you. Let me make them bigger. Okay, this one I would just put into the chat box so that all of you can get it. Hold on, guys. Let me find where is the, where is the chat box. Okay, found it. One, two, and three. There are three spreadsheets that I want to share with you. I will explain that to you. First one is to calculate election swing. All right. Um, so the easiest way I always do this is, you know, let's say this is doing Batukawa. What happened in Batukawa is that, you know, in 2016, it was won by uh, DAP. In the, sorry, 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 sorry. In 2011, it was won by DAP. In 2016, it was won by Baisa National. Okay. So what happened is that I usually would put in the voters, the votes um, received by party A, the vote received by party B, uh, received by independents. I would group all independents together. Unless, yeah, unless, guy, if the independent won, right, this seat, right, then I'll move independent to party A, right? If not, usually it's party A versus party B, right? We know that the next version will be uh, Bakatan Harapan versus GPS, right? And a number of independents, okay? The votes here, these are all um, data that you can get from SBR, from the official, and total votes received and also total votes rejected, okay? Then by using the total vote received, right? This include rejected, yeah? The reason I include rejected is that sometimes some seats have very high percentage of rejected votes. And that is interesting. If we are able to identify that, we can then ask what happened, why people um, did not vote properly. Okay. So on, once I got them, I will then use my uh, formula okay, to calculate. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Okay. I will use a formula to calculate the percentage um, got by party A, percentage of party B. Okay, percentage of independent, percentage of uh, rejected votes, right? Let me make this bigger. Okay, and then I would compare that against party A and B in 2016, right? 2016, A and B in 2016, these are the two. Okay, so from 2016 um, results, I already know the percentage, right? I put in the percentage, right? Then I will use the current result, which is party A percentage minus party A in 2016. I'll get a change. So this is what we call a change in percentage point, right? Right, not percentage of change, yeah? Okay, that is different. This is called change in percentage point, meaning that in, in this election, party A actually lost 6% of its votes compared to 2016. This is what we call a swing, right? So in this case, not just a swing, but a flip. A flip means that the opposite, the, 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 the opposition party, no, no, sorry, the incumbent, right, was uh, lost, the candidate lost and replaced by the challenger, right? So the change, you can see that it um, increased, party A increased by 6%, party B, the votes lost by 15%, okay? Why is it not plus six, minus six, probably because there was independent. Before that, there was no independent, right? And the independent percentage could be different, right? So we just want to look at how big is the change. Then we can use this, right, to make something like, like this, right? The swing, okay? So this is um, a very simple example of how you can calculate. So you can use this template if you want. You just have to put in the A, B, you know, votes, independent votes, uh, total votes received, total reject votes, right? And the formula don't change them, right? It would calculate for you, okay? So that is one. The second one I want to show you is a, is a, is how can we organize elections data from different areas, right? 
because in uh, the election we have 82 seats if i'm not mistaken correct me if i'm wrong 82 i think um seats in sarawak election then if you have reporters covering different um, um dun, different constituencies right and different reporters they will then get the unofficial results right and key in send to you you are the coordinator that receive all the results right there are more organized ways to compile all the results okay one way of doing that is to have multiple google sheets don't put everything on the same sheets why because when you have 50 reporters working on the same sheet right they will <laughs> shitty things will happen right okay no pun intended uh because then people might accidentally change your data another reporter might change another reporter data another reporter might you know type in uh, the data into the wrong constituency because all 80 constituency is on the same google sheet right so what i would do is i would split it into multiple google sheet probably 80 google sheets right each for one good so what i would do i would call it a chow sheet sheet okay chow sheet mean that this is only for one dude for example n1 right n1 n1 then probably there are only three that around mengundi in n1 right and party a how to be total votes rejected votes issue vote with return votes so the reporter stationed at n01 would put in the numbers put in numbers put in numbers right put in numbers when the unofficial results are out okay then you will get the total numbers right total numbers right then the coordinator will have another different sheet. It's called master sheet, right? Statewide. The coordinator will have the numbers from N01, N02, N03, and the total. Then he or she will be will get the total number of all states. He or she will also be able to see which one, right? Which is the winner or who is leading, correct? Right. But how do I link the data here to the data here that's a way okay you see that this, these are different two different sheets right so in the child's sheets right the reporters i only share this with this reporter so he or she won't be able to access my master sheets right she only have to focus on this one okay and the way i do that is that i'm going to i use this um formula called import range right import range and you put a bracket you put a bracket there are two variables here that you need to put in first okay you want to get the data from this here right here so first first part of the formula uh, put inside the double quotes is the url of the child sheet this url here put in that the second part of it is the name of the sheet then put an exclamation mark and the cell right which is this one so this the name of the sheet is called sheet one cell b5 correct so in the formula here we just put in sheet one exclamation mark b5 in this way we are able to link two spreadsheets together um, when you first do it it will ask you you know do you want to allow access you need to click just click yes if both sheets are belong to the same owner right in this case the same gmail account then it shouldn't be a problem to link them together but if they belong to different individuals then each side have to give consent all right so then I will build a second sheet and share with a second reporter who will fill up, you know, another sheet called N02, fill up all the data, and the data will automatically come in here. Here, the number two. Right. So in that case, you are able to con you are able to calculate everything together in the master sheets. And what you need to do is to make sure that they so and everything is live, guys. Live meaning that you know. If I change the data here, let's see. It is changed live, right? Once you type, it changed. You don't even have to refresh the spreadsheets. Isn't that great? I will just put, let's say I'll change it to 500, okay? 
Now it's 7,500, right? So look at this. Now it's changed, right? So this is a quick way and you can fit the data or whatever data into your um, visualization or into your website. Okay, that is the next step, right? But this is to organize your data so you can have live fit of numbers from your reporters on the ground who are stationed at the, uh, 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 what, do, what do we call it? The, 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 the Zoom, Pusat Jumlah, Pusat Perjumlahan, something like that. All right, and these are the things that I would like to share with you today. Still, okay.